My name is Mark Greenberg. I'm a Product Marketing Group Director at Cadence. And my presentation today is talking about moving to the AMBA 5 CHI interface protocol at the DRAM interface. And this is going to be very focused on, on memory and what you need to know when moving from other standards like AMBA 4 AXI uh, to the new CHI standard. And um, so thank you for listening today. And uh, I'll say just uh, if you haven't seen me in a year and a half, yes, I have more facial hair than before. It might stick around for a while. So let's get into the presentation. So the introduction here is that many of you will be familiar with AMBA 4. Uh, AXI interface protocol has been super popular for many years. What AMBA 5 CHI tries to do is it gives a lot of advantages to support uh, the latest uh, processors, especially for multiprocessor systems, and has new features for much larger chips. So this is what's really focusing the focus uh, and, and the driving force behind AMBA 5 CHI. The presentation today is again going to be focused on the DRAM memory subsystem and what you really need to know when you're switching from AMBA 4 AXI to AMBA 5 CHI protocol. Now I'll make a small comparison here just at, at a high level between the different, uh, uh, the different protocols. What we've done here is we have moved from a, a SIMD type of system over to a packet-based system. Uh, the SIMD system had uh, larger uh, variable size transactions. AMBA 5 CHI has got a fixed short size of transaction. We've replaced hardware handshaking with a, a credit-based flow control, and we've made some modifications to the ordering. And we'll talk about all of that over the course of today. So now let's look at our system topology and, uh, and the, taxon the taxonomy of things that are with within the system. So uh, this is a representative uh, chip here in blue on a, on a PCB that's green. The black boxes on the right are the different, uh, different uh, memory types that may be supported by the system. On the left are the requester nodes, the CPUs and caches, GPUs, custom logic that are going to be generating the majority of memory requests. Those may be connected by this box in the middle here, the interconnect or the NOC, uh, network on chip. That allows the requester nodes to be able to talk to the endpoint or the completer nodes. And so the requesters are, are, are able to talk to the endpoints. They may also talk to each other, and they may, may talk to shared caches between those, uh, between those request nodes. Then over on the right represents the, the blocks on the right are um, um, the different uh, controllers and FIs that support the different memory types. The one that we're going to be focusing on today is the Cadence DRAM controller supporting AMBA 5 CHI protocol, uh, but there are other uh, storage controllers and CXL controllers and things like that that we support as well. Together, these endpoints for memory, these are called completer nodes or endpoint nodes. Um, there is another term for it, for it uh, an older term that we don't use anymore. If you need to know what it is, you can find it in the spec. So now, now that we've looked at the block diagram of that system, what does an ideal system actually do? What would it do? So the ideal system would have a, an oracle in the system that understands everything that's going on in the system. Every request node in the system would know the location of all the data in the system on every clock cycle. It would be able to transmit data between any two locations instantly. It would have unlimited bandwidth to do that. And even if bandwidth was limited, then it would still have immediate visibility into resource usage and queue status and blockages to all the nodes so it could be able to schedule those things uh, going forward. That's an ideal system. The reality is a little bit different. Reality has laws of physics inside, and so we try to get close to this ideal by uh, synthesizing some of these features that exist within the AMBA 5 CHI protocol. So we do things like cache control with snoop transactions that are used to locate data if needed. We have layers of memory with different access times. We recognize that not all of the data can be right up next to the CPU, but some of it can. So we create an L1 cache, which would be the fastest right up next to the CPU. And then there may be larger but slower L2 and L3 caches on the die, maybe an L4 cache off of the die. Right? And then you go to main memory, and that's going to be the, the, the uh, you know, quite large, many gigabytes and very high bandwidth of, uh, of DER. And that's typically off die, and that's the subject of this presentation. If you need even deeper storage, then there's flash or storage class memory, and then finally storage. So we put these layers of memory out there. Um, now, bandwidth is a limited resource that has to be managed according to quality of service and to priority. And so we do that uh, within the AMBA 5 CHI protocol and using the resources that are provided. And, the, and there's data coming up on that in a moment. Right? And another key difference with AMBA 5 CHI is the, um, 
is the difference between the hardware handshaking, which is uh, something that doesn't scale particularly well across very large systems. AMBA 5 CHI protocol allows for a credit-based allocation system of, uh, of bandwidth and giving the, uh, the requester nodes in the system much better data about uh, what system resources are available for them to use in the system. So what are going to be the system level goals of a real DRAM subsystem in 2021? Well, there's going to be four key goals here. One of them is very high bandwidth, and it's going to depend on, on whether you're using DDR5 or LPDDR5 or GDDR6 or one of the other standards. But the key thing I want to get across here is you can get really high bandwidth in a, in a fairly small PCB area and volume. So if you look at the two pictures on, on our right here, the upper one is a DDR5 DIMM board. You'd be familiar with DIMMs if you ever built a PC back in the day. Um, uh, they slot into, into slots on the, on the uh, circuit board, and um, uh, they're a very effective way of being, uh, providing an upgradable system uh, that also has high bandwidth and very high storage capacity. The bottom picture here is a picture of an, of an LPDDR5 package. These packages are very small, typically under 15 millimeters on an edge, but they still actually provide uh, the same number of data pins and potentially even more bandwidth than a DIMM. So for volume constricted solutions or PCB area constricted solutions, like for example, in a mobile device and potentially also in automotive and other areas, um, the LPDDR5 may, may provide a high bandwidth option uh, in, in a relatively confined uh, PCB area space. All these memory solutions are low latency, and uh, what we'll be talking about today, again, will be the AMBA5 protocol feature facilities that are relevant to DRAM, and that's what you need in your AMBA5 controller. So uh, we need to do all that and, of course, maintain the AMBA5 CHI protocol coherency rules, as we'll talk about in the future slides. So let's look at uh, some of the reasons why we would want to use AMBA5 CHI protocol for DRAM. Well, the reasons why it includes the following improvements. So first of all, as I mentioned before, this credit system, right? So previously with AMBA 4 AXI, um, especially for the permissions to be able to communicate between a, a requester and, and a completer, uh, required a handshake. And that handshaking may have had to travel some distance across the, uh, the chip. As the chip gets bigger, as there becomes more wires, that handshaking becomes harder to do. So um, in AMBA 5 CHI, that system is replaced by a link layer credit or an L credit system, uh, which basically gives uh, requester nodes or, or uh, home nodes in the system the permission to communicate to an endpoint or a completer node. And then also there's the protocol credit or the P credit this allows for a number of different things, but the key thing for memory is that it provides support for speculative transla transactions, and, and those transactions may be retried, and, and also allows the, them to be allocated on a quality of service basis, and I'll show that in a minute, So um, and, and talk about the reasons why we might want to do speculative uh, transactions or um, uh, prefetches, so we'll, we'll talk about that coming up. Another key feature here in AMBA 5 CHI protocol is MPAM. The MPAM is the uh, Memory System Performance Resource Partitioning and Monitoring. And basically what that allows you to do is to partition memory across a number of different requ requester nodes in the system. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that coming up. The, uh, the CBusy or Completer Busy, this is feedback from a completer to indicate how busy the completer is and how aggressively the requester can make more requests. Again, another thing in that communication between a large number of requester nodes and completer nodes in the system that can kind of give each other more information about how each, uh, each one is doing. Another feature that we'll talk about, the memory tagging ex extension. This is something that protects a shared memory, especially in multi-user systems, and it's kind of interesting how that works. I'll talk about that coming up. And then, like I said, speculative transactions, prefetches, uh, where a, a requester asks a completer to, com to prefetch data in case it's needed for a, f a later transaction. That's also something that we can do. So now let's dig down into what does a DRAM controller look like um, that supports AMBA 5 CHI protocol. Right, so what I'm showing here, this is a block diagram of, uh, of Cadence's uh, AMBA 5 CHI controller uh, in the middle here. To the right is the DRAM Phi, and then um, other parts of the, the DRAM controller that are responsible for the DRAM protocol control and flow control and registers and things like that. But it's this sort of gray box in the middle that does all the work of the, uh, of the AMBA 5 CHI protocol. 
on the left is how it communicates into the rest of the system. So um, going over to the on the left hand side, you can see the uh, the requester node or the home node that's in the interconnect, and uh, we have a number of connections between the um, uh, the requester home node and the CHI port in the in the memory controller. So there's a very high level flow control, which is just really simply kind of a run stop. There are the uh, the link credits or the L credits that I talked about earlier. There's a command request channel being used to describe what the uh, what the home node wants uh, wants to do. There's a response channel for the um, for the completer to respond how it's done it, and then there's a write data channel and a read data channel um, uh, to to transfer read and write data back and forth. So then if we want to also just look inside of that uh, memory controller to sort of see what are the major blocks within that, uh, uh, within that CHI block, you know, there's actually quite a lot that goes on just within the, just within the CHI port, forgetting the rest of the part of the memory controller that actually handles the memory, right? So within, uh, within Cadence's uh, controller, we have these, these blocks here that I've highlighted. There's a manager, uh, uh, a manager block specifically for L credits. There's a link manager controlling the link overall. The request decoder receives the CHI requests and, and turns them into uh, requests for the um, uh, for the rest of the system as well as uh, as well as for CHI. The um, the partial write queue. This is something that um, is necessary in DRAM since the commands or the requests and the write data arrive at separate times. They can become separated from one another, and it's possible that a write request has come in. Uh, before all the right data for that request has come into the controller. And if that happens, that's something we can't actually execute the, uh, right, tr the right transaction until we've actually received all the data, because once we commit that command to the memory, that command is going. And, and if the right data is not in the memory controller, then uh, the memory in the, um, uh, in, in the external memory is going to be corrupted. So uh, we maintain this partial right queue. If, if uh, right transactions come in and not all the data associated with those transactions is available, then, uh, then we hold on to that data until it's, in, until it's available. There's a block specifically for uh, responding to requests. Um, there's a block to, uh, to handle the, um, uh, the resources and the retry queue. So that, 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 uh, the, the RMQ block is basically monitoring how busy are the, um, are the different uh, queues and resources within the memory controller and giving that information back to, uh, back to, the, uh, to the rest of the system, to the home and the requester nodes. And that block also holds the retry queue for things that have been requested but are not able to be executed on, uh, on any given so a clock cycle. There's a prefetch engine that handles the prefetches. I'll talk about that coming up. And then of course the write data channel and the read ch data channel. So there's a lot going on uh, within this, within an AMBA 5 CHI uh, based memory controller. So let's talk about that, that, that resource manager and what it's doing and also how it's doing um, uh, credit handling and quality of service as well as together with retry and CBusy, right? So basically what all these things together do is they allow you to have programmable thresholds, which allow uh, incoming transactions to have a, a priority uh, a, a priority value, uh, also called the also called the uh, the quality of service. And you can specify are things of high priority, medium priority, low priority, and then there's also sort of bulk level or, or no priority. So um, there are um, so those thresholds are, are programmable within the controller. And then there is a memory controller resource utilization, which tells us how busy is the controller, how full are its queues and things like that. And we can specify those in a range from uh, fully used, high, medium, low, and then just, you know, it's very open. And um, once we've categorized uh, both the incoming quality of service priority values, as well as the, uh, the resource utilization within the controller, then we can set um, how incoming transactions are acted upon by the by the memory controller based on uh, based on the incoming quality of service priority value and how busy the controller is at that time and that matrix here hopefully um, uh, shows that so incoming transactions um, that uh, meet the standard ie if it's a high priority transaction and the controller is either high medium low or open then those incoming that incoming transaction is uh, it passes and then it's therefore sent to the controller core for execution other commands that don't meet the test the ones that would hit the red boxes within the, the matrix on the right um, those are sent to the retry queue and so they don't have a credit to operate 
and they will be granted a P credit when the resources to do that are available. So that's, uh, that's basically what happens. And um, this allows you to do a lot of things. One of the things it allows you to do is it allows you to reserve memory bandwidth. Um, and that's something that you may typically want to do, especially in a system that has a, a lot of video transactions. A lot of video, uh, in, video processing can be very greedy and start using the data in, uh, at a time where other things need to happen. And the video data doesn't really maybe necessarily need to be processed at that moment. So you can kind of do things like you know, hold off a, a, a noisy but low importance uh, requester to be able to reserve bandwidth for the highest priority requests in the system. And then finally, this, this CBusy, um, uh, this is uh, feedback. So again, when a, when a transaction has arrived in the, uh, arrived in the memory controller, the, um, uh, the CBusy response is feedback to the uh, requester node or to the home node to indicate how busy the, uh, the DRAM resource is. And the home node or requester node can um, uh, adjust its bandwidth accordingly um, uh, based on how busy the, the memory is. So now to MPAM. MPAM allows you to partition a memory and it allows it to be partitioned amongst uh, multiple different users. Now, memory bandwidth can be allocated to different partitions uh, differently in the system. So you can either put a, a soft limit or a hard limit on the bandwidth, even if other users are not using memory. Right, and, and, so, and so why would you wanna do that? Well, you may have subscription-based access to memory in a virtual machine, and you may have virtual machine pricing based on um, the number of type and CPUs used, as well as um, the amount of memory available to the virtual ma uh, machine and the min-max bandwidth to the virtual machine. You don't want the user to have a different experience at three o'clock in the morning versus three o'clock in the afternoon. So you can actually throttle the memory usage for a particular um, requester in the system, um, even if nobody else is using memory in the system. So it allows you to do that. Another thing that, that MPAM allows you to do is, for example, partition uh, memory area and bandwidth for a real-time operating system. So if you had a, um, a, a phone or something like that that had a, a, a real-time component, um, that memory area and bandwidth could be partitioned differently from the application processor, which may be also requesting the same memory resources. So now let's look at the prefetch function, right? And this is a very common thing in the, in the tan colored box on the right here. If test, do an action, else, do a different action. And that test may, you know, the value of test may be not known. And so we have to predict, are we going to do the true or the false uh, branch of code? Well, if we wait until we know the value of test, then if we find that the, the data is all the way out in DRAM, then, um, then, then it may take some time to get it. So prefetch allows us to, do, to improve the performance of the system by sometimes reducing the latency of main memory access. So if the memory is not that busy, then, um, then what you may do is you may spend, send a speculative prefetch and the memory controller, if it has time to do so, it'll read that data and store it. And then if, the, um, if that branch is taken, then the CPU will issue the read request for that data. And it comes out uh, from the memory controller much sooner because it's already been prefetched from the memory and being stored uh, in the memory controller. And there's a lot of things that you can do. You can do profiling on this to get the, you know, to know how big the buffer should be and to be able to guide future su successful prediction. So that's a, a, a big improvement actually um, for systems that are capable of using a prefetch is to be able to, um, uh, to do this and to improve the bandwidth uh, for systems that allow it. Now let's talk about the memory tagging extensions. So one of the things I wanna get across here is, is people might have an impression that when you stop using data, that the data disappears. And it doesn't, it does not disappear. In fact, it can actually survive in a system. It can survive a reboot and you may find the data in the DRAM from the previous session that you had may still exist in the DRAM if you try to read that DRAM device, right? And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm showing here some code. You can, you can look at this later. But the, the summary of this is, is you may have two virtual machines um, running, on the, uh, uh, running on, on the same piece of hardware. Virtual machine one allocates some memory, uses it for something, and then deallocates it, right? And assumes that the memory is gone. It is not gone. 
And then you may have a uh, attacker virtual machine that wants to know what are the other virtual machines on this on this uh, device uh, putting into memory. So the virtual the second virtual machine can just allocate a, an array of memory and then start reading it and seeing what's inside there. And uh, and that's basically the the concern that you have um, for a, a security concern in a system where when you stop using the data it doesn't just disappear. So what the memory tagging extensions do is they provide you some level of security that um, uh, that the 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 requester the, the requester node that actually wrote the data is the same one or is authorized to read the data that has been um, that has been. Uh, d delivered um, uh, in, or stored in that in that region of memory. So it's really kind of a, a secondary uh, defense against certain attacks on trusted machines. And basically, you know, if if basically if, you, if if virtual machine two in this case tries to read some data which doesn't belong to it, then it um, uh, then it may trigger some security features within the operating system or the hardware uh, to prevent that from happening, and then to alert the system that there's something going on. So one of the key questions we often get here is, can I use a memory controller like a cache? AMBA 5 CHI has got all these great cache memory management features. Um, can we use the memory controller like a cache? Cadence position on this is no, right? Even though there's many cache management features within the AMBA 5 CHI protocol, only a subset are really necessary to implement them in the DRAM controller, right? So we say, no, really don't do this. And the reasons why the probability of hitting in the DRAM controller is much less than in a cache. Just the DRAM controller is, is generally um, uh, smaller, right? There's not as much buffering uh, in a DRAM controller as there would be in a cache. And the other thing is, is transactions are not intended to stay in the DRAM controller for a significant time. Unlike in a cache where, where data may rest there for some period of time, the whole objective of a memory controller, if you put write data into it, is for that data to go out into the memory. So the tenure of the data in the memory controller is not gonna be very long. The buffering within this, the memory controller is not very big, certainly not in comparison to, uh, to caches that you may have. And, um, uh, so we say, hey, look, just for those reasons, it's not really worth it to try to build a cache function on top of a memory controller. The DRAM controller design is also significantly simplified by not building that cache behavior into the controller. And um, so, so we just, you know, Cadence recommendation is not to do that. Common question we get, well, what if a read command hits on a write command that's already been scheduled to be committed to memory? Well, that can happen. If it happens, the, the function of the controller is to maintain coherency. And what that probably means is, is that that read will get scheduled behind the write in, turn, in the queuing system. That means that the write data will get flushed to DRAM, and then the read, data, the read transaction will come and read the data out of the DRAM and, and return it back to the, the rest of the system. It could be done more efficiently, but the probability of this happening is very low, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time building that functionality into, into the memory controller and adding gates and power to be able to try to snoop for those types of transactions and, and turn them around even because it's gonna happen very infrequently. So um, we're already at the end here. Uh, the summary of this is that the ARM AMBA 5 CHI protocol has got very significant advantages for high performance chips, especially ones with multiple processors that have got multiple caches, multiple interconnects. The, it's a, the CHI protocol supports a, a packet-based system that gives you increased features and flexibility, a quality of service-based credit system for effective resource management, the, uh, the more advanced revisions of the CHI protocol have got the features like MPAM, CBusy, MTE, and Prefetch to give a very efficient and partitioned and more secure memory access. And, uh, you know, so those are all the things that are necessary. And then other features, things like cache management and stuff like that, those are not part of the specification for a typical DRAM interface system. Very important for the cache, not as, not as important for the DRAM subsystem. And finally, you know, Cadence here, uh, I hope you, 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 know, you, you know, we offer very high bandwidth, low latency and feature rich uh, DRAM subsystem IP, both controllers and FIs that are interoperable with requesters and interconnects that are compliant to the AMBA 5 CHI interface protocol. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention today. Um, uh, if you're watching this live, I will be in uh, a Q&A session later on, or you can come to our virtual booth at uh, Cadence's virtual booth, and we encourage you to ask your questions or, or contact us outside uh, as needed. So thank you very much, and I um, appreciate your time today. Thank you.